Today we have a birthday girl, birthday girl. It's my mom's birthday. Say it again. It's my mom's birthday. And how old is this lovely lady? 21. We love you, Veronica. Let's just bless you. Father God, we just thank you for this young lady. We thank her for, for the transformation in her life. We thank you, Father, that she takes baby steps, Father, but she's faithful over a few things. And Father, that you can trust her with more things. And Father, being a single mom and raising these two lovely girls, and, and Father, being committed, committed to you, Father. Father, we ask that you bless her life from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. That this year, 2015, will not only be a year that she is blessed and her cup overrunneth, but Father, that you fulfill the desires of her heart. That you give her all that she needs, that she lacks no substance, nothing, Father. For you are a God that shall supply all her needs according to your riches and glory. So bless her this day and for many, 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 many years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. What the heck? It's Wednesday? This Wednesday? So we ain't going to be here? Oh, Father, my mighty, mighty warrior. That's the one of David's cousins. Little Richard. Well, I call him Big Richard. Father, we just thank you for this man, God. We thank you, Father, how we've watched his life transform right before you. Father, we thank you how you keep encouraging him. Every little thing he does, you keep encouraging that Richard, you can do it. You can do it. And Father, you watch this man grow and grow and become a mighty warrior. Mom says that there's a lion roaring inside of him. And oh, Father, we declare those things. We call those things that are not as though they were. We proclaim the righteousness and the sovereignty and the anointing of God over his life. That he shall step into all that you called him from whence he was in his mother's womb. And you have predestined him for purpose and for such a time as this. So press down, Father, shake it again, and run it over. Let Richard prosper. Not only at his job and his new position, but in you spiritually, emotionally. And Father, let him continue to be the man of his house and, and, and learn and how to lead, Father. And Father, and continue to become all that his heart's desire. So in 2015, Father, bless his life. Bless his life for things to come and things that have not come, Father. Things that he visions about, things that he has inside, Father. Let all his dreams and aspirations and goals and desires be satisfied in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And I can't do it for the purpose of that service because I got to get started, okay? Y'all going to work me out for birthdays. Let me ask Chris, is it warmer today? Yeah. Because okay. it's hot up here, Robin. I wouldn't turn down. Johnny, if I give you the signal, or if you see too much sweat coming around for me, that means we'll turn that heater down. Did you guys did, did you guys meet Peter? Okay. He's growing up. He's so big and masculine. He's like a big uh, funky wolf guy, huh? Yeah. Anyway, listen, we're gonna we're, we're we're continuing on our series, our New Year's theme. But before we start that, let me just pray one more time. Father, I just thank you for the word today. I thank you, Father, for the unspoken word, the spoken word, Father. The word that goes in and ministers and within our spirit, Father. The word that goes in through hearing the word through our ears, that is processed through our mind and deposited into our spirit. And once it is in there, Father, it cannot be removed. It cannot be taken. For it is covenant, Father. It is sealed within our bosom, Father, this word of God. So, Father, I ask today that being that and have an ear, let them hear what God is saying. Let them hear what the Spirit is speaking. I ask, Father, that you come and you visit us in this place, that you make the word not confusing, but, Father, that is simple, that we can understand. But without understanding, we have nothing, Father. So, Father, I bless your word today. I bless your service today. And, Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and you visit this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn to Matthews. 
fourth chapter. Man, I can't get that song. Holy, but I can't sing it anyway. But I, I can sing. Don't let me start singing. Okay, sorry. Matthews, 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 Matthews. Matthews 4, verse 5. You know, we've discussed three things so far. We discussed, we're, we're talking about the three temptations, the three lies that the enemy uses. He tells us that I am what I do, which is performance. And we discussed that last week, that we live on that plateau that we have to perform. We're talking about, and the second one is possessions, that I am what I have, that if you don't have that nice thing, those fancy cars, those those Jordans, that, that, nice, that, those, those, that nice house, you, you, you don't have anything, so the world spends billions and billions of dollars seducing you to make you think that you have to have that because you are driven with these three temptations which produces a false self, which is not your authentic self, but is somebody else. You are trying to emulate or trying to and, and trying to be like it. So you waste all your time and energy of trying to be like Mike, unquote, Michael Jordan, not Michael Davis, okay? Because Michael Davis, he's a good guy too. So I don't mind if you want to be like me too. But remember, you have to end up being a preacher, okay? And then so today we're going to do the third one, which I didn't get a chance to do last Sunday, which is the most important one. And I'm... I'm really not sad, but I really wish that more people was here because this is the one thing that seems to either make our self-esteem high or bring us down low. It's the one thing that if you listen to the praise and worship, we specifically pick those songs because they were talking about being popular. They're talking about being accepted. So I want to condemn and condone the lie of popularity. So today we're going to talk about what others think popularity. And then I'm going to try to squeeze in one of the four authentics, uh, authentic, becoming your authentic self topics, because I feel like that'll help me get through next Sunday, and then the series will be over, and then we're going to go on to our worship series, which I've been dying to preach to you guys. It's, I've learned, well, let me just say this, worship is not what you think it is. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. It's not a song, it's not a music, it's more than that. And worship is more than you can ever imagine. And it's just something we've never heard, and so it's something we need to learn. But anyway, I'll, I'll begin with the popularity, starting in Matthew 5. Uh, for those that wanted to get the whole series, we started in 1 Samuel 17, and chapter 20 went to 46 when David slew Goliath. Okay, so in uh, Matthew 4, 5, it says this, now, this is a funny thing. In chapter 4, and I told you guys to read it, in chapter 4 we have all false self-temptations, all lies that the devil told Jesus when he was fasting. We, the devil told Jesus that you have to have possessions. The devil told Jesus that you have to uh, perform, okay? And now the last lie that the devil will tell Jesus that all is found in chapter 4 is that you have to be popular. It says in verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. So imagine this probably was the highest point of the temple back then, of the synagogue. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you, and that on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written also, snag a tooth. Oh, that <laughs> on the other hand, it is written also, you ODB. On the other hand, it is written also that you shall not put the Lord thy God to test. In other words, you should not tempt thy Lord. And see, the point of this, this scripture right here is what the devil tried to do. Not only did he play on Jesus' emotions, and he played on Jesus' esteem, but he tried to have Jesus go in and, and act out a silly thing to prove that he was somebody. See, some of you kids at school, some of us grown-ups, we had to act out and do some silly things to be accepted because 
We wanted to be on the in crowd. So some of us would be in college and we would drink that beer bong and chug, 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 chug. Because you know, if you could chug it all, dude, you was popular. It proved one thing, guess what? That you can get drunk and that you can drink a lot. Now, how's that working out for you? Okay, and then we have those that are driven with success and popularity that if I don't win the beauty queen contest, oh, you got these mothers that push these little daughters and they dress them up in makeup and they, you know, their whole life is winning a competition to be popular. I miss somebody, miss South Dakota, miss Kentucky, whatever it is. And so we have these things and it's all from a false self. It's all a lie that the devil presented even way back in Jesus' time. You see, popular means the fact of being liked. It means admiration. It means approval or accepted by people or a group of people. How many want to be popular? Raise your hand. Don't lie. That's what this whole thing is about. I want to be popular. But not in the world's eyes, in God's eyes. I want the demons of darkness to know that when I pray, they fear the word of God. I want to rock the kingdom of darkness when I call those things forward as though they're not, and they know who I am. I want to be popular in God's eyes. I want to be popular in God's kingdom. I want to be popular to be able to call those things that are not as those they were, to lay hands on the sick and watch them be healed. I want to be popular knowing that this is a committed man to God. And yes, I'm popular in God because God has appointed me to that position. So it's okay to be popular in the right things. But I don't want to be known as the popular guy that can jug jug the beer or the guy that can have and go to bed with all these different women or the guy that can do something stupid like jump off a two-story building and break his bones. I mean, I've seen people do all kinds of things to be popular. Or a guy that lies about his accomplishments and what he's done to be popular. You know, sometimes we have a tendency because we live in our false self mode to say things that are not true or, or, or to exaggerate. Well, uh, what I'm here to tell you today that when you exaggerate kids and you make your story bigger, it's called lying. And see, that's a lot of things that we do to become popular. And so what the devil wanted Jesus to do was to do something stupid, something silly, to show that he was popular because he had no notoriety. It says here that the devil told Jesus to throw himself from the highest part of the temple so that people might believe in you. Believe in you. Listen, is this why we become popular? So people can believe in us? I thought people would believe in you if you was just you. What happened to that? It's a false lie. It's a temptation of one of the three that makes a false person. Listen, Jesus knew who he was. You see, again, Jesus had not started his ministry. And at the point, people didn't know him. He had no worth and no value. He was from Nazareth. And as it says, nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. And so Jesus wasn't nobody yet. But what he did, he began to prepare himself to fast and to get ready for the start of his ministry. You see, here's the thing. We all think and place too much emphasis. We all think and put too much emphasis on what people think more than we're willing to admit. Don't lie to yourself. I knew it with both hands. Oh, I want to be like Oh, I want to be like that. Oh, Father, I want to be like that. Oh, I hope they like Oh, I hope this isn't. Oh, I hope my boss likes me. Cause, oh, I hope he likes my brand. Oh, I hope it may. Oh, I hope I do good in my inventory because I do inventory and people see my score. They're going to say, Ooh, wow, Mike Davis, that guy really knows what he's doing. He's popular. See, we put too much emphasis on As Popeye would say, I am what I am. <laughs> I'm Popeye. Let's say it, man. 
Yes, even at a young age, I learned that truth from Popeye the Sailor. Okay? <laughs> See, and what we do is we, we put all that pressure to self. We do things like this. I wonder what they'll say when I strike up a conversation. I, I, I wonder, should I go tell Johnny he hurt my feelings? Should I go tell Stacy she hurt my feelings? I, I, I don't want to be unpopular. I don't want to be the one that, that, that spoils it for everybody and tells me you know, how I feel and, and because then I'll become unpopular. I don't want to be the one that stands out in the crowd and says, no, that's not me. I, I don't want to do that. You know, and then we, we go through these high school reunions. Oh, my gosh. Yes, everybody knows that I'm a feature of my high school reunion because I did a video shot and I couldn't make it. But I was so popular in school and sports that I never missed the high school reunion. Everybody would look to see what Mike Davis was doing. And you know, two years ago I didn't feel the pressure that I even had to go perform again. I, I sent the video and said, hey guys, I love you guys. I miss you class in 1983. I'm a pastor and I'm serving God. And I just want to bless each and every one of you. Oh, that was Mike Davis. Have a great time and hopefully I'll see you in the next 10 years. God willing. And that was my visit. See, at one time I, 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 I decided that since I was so successful in everything at high school and I was on all the sports and was the captain and was the star and had all the fame and all that and all the girls, I didn't feel that no more. I, th I, think, I think when I found God and started self-examining myself, I think I, I started to become who I'm truly supposed to be. Huh. It's kind of interesting. High school reunions, those that got them coming up, what will you say today when you go to your high school reunion? What would you say the next year when you have your high school reunion? Will you be known and tell someone, hey man, that's not me no more. I serve God. Hey brother, how's your life going? How's your family? How many kids you got? Well, how many kids you got? Oh, I got two. Yes, I'm doing great. Really? So what's been going on with your life? Oh, nothing. Just serve God. <laughs> Opportunity for ministry. Before you say, oh man, I'm doing this and doing that and that. I got a big boat this time and I bought a cabin and you know, I'm on my third marriage. <laughs> the other two didn't work out too well, so I had to kick them to the curb, you know what I'm saying? And I'm still an OG player. Yeah. Ooh, I love at your boy. Okay? You know, like we was in high school. Right? Listen. And then, you, and then we have this. Ooh, this is the big one. OMG, 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 OMG. I wonder what they really say about me behind the closed door, Richard. You got your new promotion. Some guys are hating on you. I wonder what they really, really say about you, Simeon. Got that new job at Village Inn, looking all fresh in your uniform, <laughs> saying, hi, welcome to Village Inn. I'm your friend. Can I do it again? What would you like? Where do we begin? Don't be still in that. Don't be still in that. Okay, that's fine. Oh, guess, guess, guess what? You're more popular than me, huh? Yeah, you're, you're, you're too cool for school, huh? Well, stand up. Tell us how you say I can tell you're a preacher's son. That's good. I'd be like, what you want? This is my quick week. And I don't need no complicated order. No, Sam is, see, the reason why I had him tell us that, stop up now, listen. Because that's who Sam is. That's him not caring about what anybody else is thinking. He's being himself. 
And one thing I can think about Sim through his whole life, only after when he was third and fourth grade, I had to go up there and correct him. But when I walked to the school with Sim in third and fourth grade, because I had to go see the teacher, because guess what? Sim was too popular. OMG, we walk, hey Sim, hey Sim. <laughs> oh man, you should have saw it, it was just, Sim, hey Sim, girls, hey Sim. Guys, I'm like, golly, what are you got the one coming up here? I see you just too popular. Everybody knows Sims. And then the third grade teacher, I can't remember his name, goes, yes, yeah, Sims very popular. He doesn't know when to stop talking in class because he's too popular. See, those popular kids, when it's time to sit down and listen to the teacher, you still want to be popular. You still want to be the clown, the class clown. So you still be acting a fool, trying to be somebody instead of shutting your mouth and sitting down being quiet like everybody else. Though he had no medical condition. <laughs> he was just too popular. He was caught up and trying to find himself. He was a third and fourth grader trying to figure it out. Do I go this way or do I go this way? Will they like me? When do I need to be quiet? I know the teacher said, okay, everybody sit down, but I still want to be known. I still want to be seen. I still want to be popular, and then they would call his dad. And I would text him back, an uh, email back, please have my son read this email. If you don't sit your butt down when you get home, I will beat you. Do you understand? <laughs> Simeon, your dad has a message for you. <clears throat> and that's how we turn that corner with Simeon. Me and the teachers was like, yeah. Simeon didn't do nothing. <laughs> And it went all the way to his sophomore year when the teachers were, he was still being popular. That I'd be cooking dinner and put in Mr. Davis, this is Simeon's teacher. And I'm like, yeah. Well, uh, Simeon seems to have the same problem. I said, you mean the same problem in third and fourth, fifth and sixth and seventh grade? Yes, he won't be quiet. He's still being popular, okay? So I tell the teacher, you call me again, I'm gonna and then I told one teacher, well, what do you want me to do? How many whoopings do you want me to get? One swat, two swat, three swats? Oh, sir, I don't want you to whoop. Then don't call me again. Because if you call me again, I'm going to whoop the popularity out of him. And Sim has always been the bubbly child. Oh, my gosh. I wish I, wish I could be a lot like Sim. But God gave me three different kids, and let me tell you, three different personalities. <laughs> But Sim was the one that I know that was on that popular thing, and that's why I use you as an example, Sim. Okay, back to the line. Bottom line is this. Our self-image soars with the compliment. Write that down. Our self-image soars with the compliment and is devastated by criticism. Oh, you can say all the good things you want about me. You can talk about, what, what you say, old school sex? You can talk about me if you please, but I talk about you on my knees. Yeah. You see, that's a that's an old saint that got mad. They were devastated. They had been complimented, and then soon as someone said something that criticized them, oh, they prayed too loud, they prayed too loud. I don't like what they've been wearing. It devastated them. So to have some kind of reaction that would be biblical and holy, they would say in that coin that phrase, you can talk about me if you please. But I'm talking about show me. That means I'm gonna tell my daddy. I won't go and fight you. I won't go and make a scene, but I will go. But see, here's the thing. We're crushed when we get criticized. We have to learn, they call it constructive criticism. <laughs> you know, who invented that word? I hate constructive criticism. To me, it's all criticism because I can't see the constructive part of it. And neither can you when you're getting it. But it's their educated, polite way of reprimanding you or correcting you without you getting offended. Because, see, they know that with a compliment, you soar. But when you are criticized, it devastates you. And the reason why we use constructive criticism is because we want you to take this whooping and go be productive. 
We want you to take this woman and go do what I still have you doing. It's the same with God. He wants you to take that woman and keep on trucking. Because who he loves, he chastens. And sometimes he has to bring us out of that popularity mode and whoop us. It says this, son and daughter, who cares what they think about you? Who cares what they say about you? Stop trying to be popular. Stop trying to please men, for it is better to please God than to please man. Amen? Amen. Amen. Quit fearing the one that can only destroy your body. Fear the one that can destroy your body and your soul. Popularity. Listen, true freedom is not what Abraham Lincoln came up with an emancipation proclamation for the slaves. True freedom is that when Moses led the children of Israel that had been in bondage and slavery for 400 years. True freedom was not when we went over there and liberated the Jews from the concentration camps. True freedom comes when we no longer need somebody special when we no longer need somebody special to tell us that we're special. Uh -uh, go ahead. When we no longer need somebody that's special to tell us that we're special. You see, sometimes our compliment if it's just somebody that ain't important don't mean anything. But oh, if Barack Obama called me and said, Mike, I want you to know you're doing something special. You started a small church, and I'm proud of you. <laughs> oh, man. True freedom comes when we no longer need to be validated by anybody. Big, tall, fat, or small, it doesn't even matter. That's true freedom. It's not the bondage. It's what keeps us in bondage. True freedom only comes when we finally accept that we don't have to be popular. Like the song says, in my father's eyes, I'm popular. That's all you need to be. See, don't allow these lies to deceive you. They're always hunting us. They're always tormenting us. They're always trying to convince us of one thing. These three false lies, these three false temptations, they only want to convince us of one thing, guys. This is the strategy in, of the devil. This is his purpose, that I am what I do for performance. I am what I have, which is possessions. And I am what other things, which is popularity. And you can all find it in chapter 4. But it's all to make one thing, one lie, one lie. It makes us want to think this, that God loves, that God's love for us will never, never be enough. It wants to keep you empty. It wants to keep you in false self mode so that you will never find who you were truly to be because you spent your whole life trying to have possessions. You spent your whole life on a performance plateau and now you spent the rest of your life trying to be popular, trying to fit in, all to make one thing in your life, all to produce one little lie. It takes three lies, three deceptions to produce one lie in your life that this is, that God's love for us will never be enough because we are not lovable, Johnny, and you are not good enough, Stacy. And that's it. So he uses these things so that you never, ever can be satisfied. That you never, ever can be content in being a nurse. That you never, ever can be content with driving a little Toyota Camry instead of a Mercedes Benz. That you never ever can be content and not being most likely to succeed in school instead of the stock person that nobody knows. See, so you built this false lie. You built this false person. And then in the world and commercials and society and friends and pressure tells you you have to conform to this only to make you believe one lie. That you're not good enough for God. And that you're not lovable. And that you never will be good enough. That you're not worthy. You see, the devil's biggest trick was not to get men to sin. The devil's biggest trick was to get men to break fellowship 
but God. The devil's biggest trick was to get man to not believe that there's not a God. The devil's biggest trick was to erase all that God done because he was so full of jealousy and hate for us humans that he says, you know what? Not only will I kill and destroy them and torment them and make them demented and confuse them and steal from them and kill them, but I'll make them curse you. I'll make them forget about you. And he's done a good job. See, if we work as hard as the devil, we be somewhere. He's always on his job. <laughs> Just like God is. You see, here's the thing. When we allow these three things to control us, when we allow these three things to drive us, this only wants to produce the biggest lie. It only wants to let you know that you'll never, ever be satisfied with God. And the only way is you have to go through you see, we used to sing a song. I have left all the world to follow Jesus. And see, the reason why we sing that song is because when we come to that point of salvation, we're done with the three lies. We're done with popularity. We're done with gathering possessions. We're done with performance. But not all of us. Some of us carry that lifestyle into the church. And then you have churches. It's all about performance. You have churches that are, oh my gosh, it's all about possessions. How big can my building be? How many people can I see? Where's my Starbucks in my movie theater in the lobby? You see, possessions. And how popular are we? How big can we go? You know, I remember reading the Bible that Jesus wasn't very popular. You see, when we read about these men in the Bible, they're not popular. They were just feared for their obedience. See, Elisha, he wasn't popular. They hated him. But they knew him because of his obedience to God. And they knew that that was a man of God. You see, Moses, I imagine many of them hated him. For 40 years, dude, he told us he was taking us out for a couple weeks. And it's been 40 years, my mama didn't die, my mama, mama didn't die, my brother didn't die, and we still out here. Guarantee he wasn't popular. He surely wasn't popular to his own brothers and sisters. You see what I'm saying? David, David, David. Oh, he was so unpopular, Saul hated him, huh? He had to live like a wild animal. Whatever cave he can find, whatever food he can raid, whatever he can live, just to survive. You see, being popular in the world don't mean nothing. Like Janet Jackson says, what have you done for me lately? That's your attitude with the world. What has the world done for you lately? Hmm. Think about that. You see, there are many Christians that will go to their graves every day, never knowing who they are for their entire walk. They were always trying to be somebody that they're not. They were always trying to wear somebody's armor that wasn't theirs. They were always trying to pray like Sister Davis. They were always trying to preach like Brother Mike. They were always trying to be like Gustav with his humble heart. They were always trying to be somebody else that they created their own self-image instead of just being who they are like my favorite person in the world, Big Richard. I love you, Richard. <laughs> so big and masculine can destroy you. But gentle and kind as a yes, baby, sir. baby, baby bear. <laughs> I bet she's like one of those little kids that purr and use the whole little big Richard holding in your arms. You can... <laughs> but you know what they say about us giants? They take our kindness for weakness. Right. I'm sure Big Richard has some personal rage in him that two time to time will come out. <laughs> you don't want to make a bear mad. <laughs> right, Richard? But Richard is who he is. He's not trying to be something that he's not. And this is what we're talking about. He can care less if he was popular or not. He can care less. I've known him for a while. He's never been trying to be popular. 
Matter of fact, he's very quiet. And you know what I love about him? He's real. What you see is what you get. That's not like a song. That's not. Don't get sucked into the lie, guys. As we come out of these three false temptations, always remember that you don't have to perform in God. You just got to be yourself. That you don't have to be like Floyd Mayweather who drives you crazy. I love Floyd as a fighter, but as a person, oh my gosh, he is just so full of himself. He is an epitome, an example of what I'm preaching about. I guarantee that I would love to be unpopular Mike Davis, not T.D. Jakes, not the black Joe Osteen that someone referred to me as. <laughs> I don't know how I got that compliment. But just to be old Mike Davis and to go up to Floyd, who's 5'7", 140 pounds, and I'm bigger than him, and just put my arm around Floyd and say, Floyd, you know what? Dude, you're my favorite fighter. I love you, man, for your ability and your athleticism. But you know what, Floyd? You make me sick. And Floyd, Floyd, listen to me. Who are you, and how well do you know that person? I would take them back to the beginning of the city. Those are the two questions I asked you guys. Who are you? You see, Floyd don't know who he is. He's on the money team. He's this, he's that. He's everything that these three false selves told him to be. They said, Floyd, you got to be the best, so you have to perform. They said, Floyd, in your success of performance, you have to have possessions. So he's got like 30 cars. And then I got my son looking at him, your son looking at him, and everybody thinks that we got to be like that when we are blessed. So we take on this false identity that we have to live with these things. And if we don't have these things, then we're not noticed. You see, to live for God doesn't mean you have to be holy. To live for God doesn't mean you have to be righteous. Now listen to me. To live for God means you have to stay faithful to your true self. And only in knowing who you are, you can know God. Imagine you all fake and phony, fool with the three lies, trying to come to God. God, how you doing today? I'm going to say this prayer, but, you know, I really don't have no meaning in it and feeling in it, but, you know, I was just told that I, this is something I just got to do. And God's like, get out of here. Go on, go about your business. Come to me when you really want to talk to me. Come to me when you're your authentic self. Come to me when you're that person that I formed from when she was in your mother's womb. You know, that soft, gentle person that I created before the world created this person. Come to me when you face reality. Because God says that he loves a broken, contrite spirit. He loves when you come to him when you're at the end of yourself. Because you're seeking something better than yourself. Because, see, the world had lied to you so long to make you a false self that God says that when you come to him, I'm ready to clean you up, son and daughter. When you come to him, I'm ready to, to shake off the Mari clay and put your feet back on solid ground. When you come to me, I'm ready to break off that lie and that lie and that lie that you lived for all these times. When you come to me, I'm ready to restore you back to who you really are. So instead of you being a proud, loud, obnoxious person, what I really made you to be was a quiet, sincere man or woman of integrity where your actions do all the talking. Yeah. You mean, God, I thought that I had... No, that's not who I created you. That's who you created. That's who the devil created. That's who the world created. That's who your false self created. So then we ask this, Mike, okay, some of us have been like this for a long time. Some of us have been in the church for a long time and we've never heard a sermon like this. Some of us never had to examine ourselves. Well, where do we begin to change? Because I thought I was good. I thought, I thought everything was cool. I, I thought I knew myself. I, I didn't know I was still acting on those false selves. I didn't know that.